Great, thank you. Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, my name is Marco Brown. I work as a developer relations engineer at Google. And today we're gonna compose an API together. So we're gonna take a look at Jetpack Compose and see how Kotlin is used to achieve the various things that are in its API and also how it inspired those APIs in a way. So I really do believe that everyone writing code is an API designer. Like you cannot avoid designing APIs, even if you're not shipping a library that then other people are gonna use, you're still gonna create APIs that your teammates are gonna use or you yourself are gonna use in the future. So it's good to create nice APIs. So, uh, based on Hadi's survey in the morning, a lot of you are not mobile developers. Uh, I want to ask who here has, let's see, who has not heard of Jetpack Compose before? Okay, that's a lot of people, so we're starting at the right place. So, Jetpack Compose is Android's modern toolkit for building native UI, and we're going to be exploring some of its APIs in this talk, but we're not going to actually learn uh, what uh, Compose is in detail. Uh, but what you have to know for now is that it replaced an old view system which we had from more than a decade ago originally when Android first started and it makes things a lot more flexible and is just a much better fit for modern application development. Here's some code that you'll see if you create a brand new project for Jetpack Compose in Android Studio. This is a Kotlin function annotated with Composable and it takes the name as a parameter, and then it will call another composable function to display that name on the UI. And um, this is just gonna show you hello and whatever name was passed in. So for example, you would see something like this on the UI if you passed in Android as a parameter. What's important about Compose is that it has a great state management system, and that's also not something that we would uh, cover in depth here, but what you need to know is that it can detect changes in application state over time, and recompose function, meaning that as the state changes, for example, let's say that this name changes in the application, it can re-execute the function so that the UI also gets updated. So for example, later on as the name changes, we could see something else on our UI like this. So composable functions have this special ability that they can be re-executed to update what you're looking at, and therefore we need to somehow enter this special world of composable functions. And another thing that you get in your Hello World project when you generate it in Studio is an activity, which is an entry point to an Android application. And in there, to start calling composable functions, you need to call set content. And you can see here in this basic project that we're setting up a team, then we have a surface which fills the screen and provides some background. And within that, we are calling that greeting function from the previous slide, which will display Hello Android. So some things I want to highlight about Compose. First of all, it's declarative. Uh, with other frameworks like the view system on Android, you would create view instances um, and then somehow call mutating methods on them and manage their state. In Compose, this doesn't happen. You describe the shape of your UI declaratively and Compose will keep track of state changes and update the UI as and that needs to be done. Then it's built with Kotlin. This is obviously really important for us today. Uh, that's why we, we are uh, discussing it. And this means a lot of things. So you can write code in Compose just the exact same way that you would write all of your other Kotlin code as well. Uh, previously, we had to deal with layouts and resources coming from XML and trying to bridge those two worlds. Here, you're just editing Kotlin code like anywhere else in your application. So UI code is just writing Kotlin code as is uh, all other parts of your app. And this also means you get all of your usual tooling support and all of that for editing Kotlin. And finally, what I want to highlight is that Compose is open source. So you can go ahead and check out all of the underlying implementation in Compose. It's really easy to dive into it, for example, directly in Android Studio, just navigate to declarations and explore how Compose is architected internally. There's a lot of great usages of Kotlin in there. So let's start exploring some of these APIs that Compose uses, and we're gonna start with some usages of extension functions. And this entry point we've seen previously, uh, this call to set content is actually already an extension function. So Compose is not part of the OS itself, instead it ships as, in, as an unbundled library. So the entry point to it is also part of that library, which simply extends the uh, activity type. And you can see that set content is a regular function, but then as a parameter, it will take a function type, which is a composable function. So there you can start calling functions that will produce UI and that um, are special composable functions. 
And if you've used Kotlin for a while, this will probably look very familiar to you, this kind of bridging function, because it's quite similar uh, to what we have with coroutine builders, where they are also bridging the world of regular functions and this world where we have special functions, in that case, suspending ones, and in the case of compose, composable ones. There's a lot more to be said about the parallels between suspending and composable functions, which I don't have time to do today, but I'll point you to some resources at the end of the talk. Another API that's a really great example of how extensions are used in Compose are the modifiers. Uh, these modifiers are ways of customizing the appearance of UI components in Compose. And you can see the API being used here. Uh, the way that you can customize the appearance of something, in this case a box, which is a simple rectangular layout, is that you pass in a single modifier parameter, which can contain all kinds of different customizations. So here uh, we are um, specifying the size, the background, and the padding of this um, composable UI component. And notice that we don't have to pass in all of these things separately. So when implementing the box, uh, you wouldn't have to uh, provide a size parameter and the background parameter and the padding and who knows what else. Instead, you can just take and properly implement a single modifier parameter, and then um, you can easily receive a lot of these customizations. And you would want to do this in all of your custom components as well. So for example, the greeting composable from before should also receive a modifier parameter. Uh, let's explore how this API is uh, actually implemented then. So as you can see, we can just write down modifier and then start chaining uh, various calls onto it. And if you start auto-completing in your IDE on modifier, you'll see dozens and dozens and dozens of modifiers for padding and borders and backgrounds and all of these things that you would want to have uh, on a piece of UI. And if we jump into the implementation, we'll see that modifier itself is an interface and this is a simplified view of it, but I wanted to highlight the then function inside it, which actually is part of the implementation of this chaining behavior, where it can take another modifier and then return a new combined modifier, which combines the uh, two effects of the modifiers. And then there is also a companion within this interface, which implements the interface and acts as an empty implementation. So here you can see that the then method, which is supposed to combine the companion object with some other modifier, simply returns the other modifier. Therefore, the companion was really just an empty implementation. And this companion is what you're using when you write down modifier in Compose so that you can start chaining things onto it. The name of the interface type modifier is pointing to the companion object. And this is also used, this empty companion object of modifier is also used as the default argument by convention for this parameter. So when you're creating your own composables, you can default the modifier parameter to modifier, which is the companion. And that will um, be just no modifications by default. But if someone does provide that argument, then you can apply those um, inside your implementation. So we have all of these functions on modifier available, which are not part of the interface because we didn't see them when we were looking at the interface implementation. So where do all of these come from? Well, the title of the slide really gives it away. All of these are defined as extensions, which means that they don't have to reside within the same file and they can even come from different packages and libraries and artifacts in Compose. So for example, there's a foundation package that would give you a background modifier or a gestures package to make things draggable or scrollable with modifiers or a layout package or a draw package. And all of these can contribute different implementations of modifiers into this <laughs> ecosystem of modifiers, if you will. And just like these are architected, you could also very easily create your own modifier extensions, your own uh, modifier implementations that are also defined as extensions and reuse whatever customization you need on a lot of your UI components inside your application. Let's take a look at one of these as an example to continue exploring Compose. So let's say that we want to clip something using the clip modifier. As you can see, this has a parameter which is a shape, and one of the values that we could pass in there is a circle shape. Now, looking at this API, uh, what would we assume that circle shape is? It looks maybe like an enum value, or maybe like an object, but if you're familiar enough with IntelliJ syntax highlighting, you'll know that this is actually a property. So 
Um, this property is breaking the normal naming conventions in Kotlin because usually you would want to have a lowercase initial letter for property names or if we're using it as like a Java style constant, we would have this kind of naming for it. Uh, but instead, composes, Compose chooses to use uh, this convention. And the thinking here is that you shouldn't really care about what the underlying implementation is of the API, as long as it's of the shape and, um, no pun intended, and um, has the behaviors that you expect from it. So here, circle shape might as well be an object from looking at just the use site, and therefore the property also follows that kind of naming convention. It's a single um, value. You can reuse that object over and over again, um, so it doesn't really matter how it's implemented. And the same kind of philosophy is found on the other, other side of this assignment as well, where we are apparently creating a instance of rounded corner shape by calling its constructor. If we take a look at that type, we'll see that it's a class, but it doesn't have a single parameter. Instead, it has four different parameters for the rounding of the four corners. So that call there is not a constructor call. Instead, what it is, is a call to a top-level function which looks like a constructor call because it has the exact name of the type that it's going to create. It does actually create a new instance for you that it will return. And it also uh, it also begins with an uppercase letter as well. So that type name is preserved as it is. Uh, this is not uncommon in first party Kotlin code either. So if you've used coroutines, there are many things there that have similar factory functions like job or coroutine scope or channel. Um, and this is the same convention being applied with Compose. Uh, this, by the way, is kind of an example of extension-oriented design because having this constructor, constructor uh, defined externally to the class lets the class stay minimal in its implementation, so it's much easier to reason about and it has fewer responsibilities overall. And even things like this, like the creation of the class, can be added on as separate top-level declarations. It's not literally an extension, but it's the same kind of idea. And there are a bunch of these overloads because we can just easily create these uh, externally to the class. So for example, instead of taking a percentage, there's an overload that takes a float, which would be a value in pixels, or an overload that takes a DP value, which is a density independent pixel for Android. And there's also one that takes different corner sizes for each corners, again in DPs, which is a common unit of measurement for Android. And you can see that all of these are defaulted to zero values. So, for example, if you wanted to create something like this, a shape for uh, this piece of UI, where you want three rounded corners but no rounding on the bottom left corner, then you could call this function with name parameters and only specify the parameters where you do want rounding and let the rest, uh, well, the remaining uh, fourth one, uh, remain a zero value. The usages of default values and um, that allow you to customize things, what don't mandate that you provide those parameters is really, really widespread in Compose. There are composable functions that have like a dozen parameters, but only maybe one or two of them are required. And everything else, if you do want to customize and want to pass them in, can be passed in as named arguments, which is a really uh, core part of Kotlin. It's a very simple thing that all Kotlin functions are capable of, but it is used really heavily in Compose. By the way, side note, you could also create the same shape with this syntax. So instead of creating it with the corners you want initially, you could create a shape that has 16 dp rounded corners on each corner and then copy it and set one of the corner sizes to 0 dp to remove the rounding there. And this comes very intuitively to us as Kotlin developers because we're used to data classes offering it. But rounded corner shape is not actually a data class. But because it serves the same function, it has a manually implemented copy method that has the exact same semantics as the data classes copy method would have. So you can just try copying it and it will work because the method is there. The naming convention of having uppercase names that are nouns also translates to all UI components in Compose. I don't want you to read all of this code. Uh, this uh, snippet displays the UI that you can see next to it. And if you take a look at just the uppercase function calls here, that will actually show you the shape of the UI quite well. So you can see that this entire piece of UI is in a column, which is a layout that arranges things vertically. And then there are four different pieces of UI there, a logo, a divider, and two, two buttons. And these are calls to composable functions, which are unit returning, but they still have this style, which kind of looks like a constructor call. 
because as these functions are called in Compose, UI will exist as a result of calling it. So um, it's not exactly mimicking a constructor, but it's kind of like that. So the naming convention is also the same. We can also use this same example to take a look at scopes. If you uh, take a look at column here, which takes a trailing lambda, then that trailing lambda is used for scoping because every other composable function you call inside it will be inside the column, logically speaking. And this is very common in Compose. And in some cases, you also get a receiver within these lambdas. For example, here you get a receiver called a column scope, which gives you some extra functionality that wouldn't otherwise be generally available just anywhere in your application. So here, for example, you get an extra modifier that you can use only within a column, which you can use to align things horizontally within the column. For example, it's used here to center the logo on the top. And the way that this is implemented is that the align modifier is still an extension on modifier like all others that we've looked at before, but it's declared as a member extension in column scope, so you can only call it if you're already scoped into a column scope somehow. Uh, there's also a really costly thing being used here, which is a DSL marker annotation. Uh, this generally helps you uh, with some tooling support like syntax highlighting if you're creating DSLs and you annotate the constructs that are a part of your DSL. But the reason why it's applied here is to make sure that you're scoping things correctly. So previously, we've seen that you can use this align modifier directly within a column to arrange something horizontally um, within the column. But if you were to nest this further, for example, if we also had another level, which is a, which is a button um, in this code, the align modifier would still be in scope because the outer column scope is still providing us the align modifier. However, because we are now calling that in an implicit outer scope, um, the compiler would prevent us from making that call because that DSM marker annotation is there. So that can be used to make sure that your constructs that are part of a DSL are only being called in the direct scope and not on implicit receivers. Another place where we can spot scopes in Compose is conversions between measurement units. So I've already mentioned that we have this DP unit on Android, which is a density independent pixel, which is usually used in designing applications because uh, screens might have the same size but different resolutions, so designing in pixels uh, wouldn't work. But when we actually want to draw something on the screen, we eventually have to convert these DPs into real pixels. And for that, an extension like seen here would be really nice to have, but you cannot do that directly because you also need information about the density of the screen. So in Compose, the way you would do this is you would get an instance of density from somewhere, and then you would have to scope yourself into it, for example, using Kotlin's width function. And in there, you would finally be able to um, call a 2px extension function. And this is implemented very, very similarly to the column scope we've seen before. So this, again, is an interface which contains a member extension, making sure that you can only use that extension if you are already in the scope of a density. And you can also see that this interface contains the value that's required to do that calculation. There are also other places in Compose where you don't need to scope yourself into a density uh, object, but instead you receive that as a scope automatically, kind of. Uh, for example, there's a grid API where you can create your own grid cells implementation, which is going to be an object that can define the number of columns in a grid as well as their size in pixels. And because you're expected to return pixel values from the function that you overwrite it in this interface, this uh, interface function is defined as a member extension on density so that you can immediately use methods that convert dps into pixels uh, within the method. This, by the way, uh, because we're talking Kotlin here, would be a really nice candidate for the upcoming co context receivers feature. And um, so instead of using um, density as a regular receiver, it could be a context in both of these cases. Uh, now, this is not an API in Compose, and I'm not promising that it ever, ever will be, but it's something interesting to look at, and it would be pretty nice, semantically speaking. I want to show you something quick about performance. So uh, let's talk about inline classes a bit. There are a handful of usages of inline classes in Compose. For example, the color class is a really good one that you should explore after this talk on your own. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is DP, which is a simpler class. Uh, because it's a measurement, it's just a float value wrapped as an inline class. And as you can see, everything else related to it is also inline. So all of the operators contained within the class, but also all of the utilities that are around the class as top level constructs, like the DP extension property that we've seen before, so that you can write down things like 0.dp and create an instance of this 
class. And so, because everything's in line here, once you start doing operations and calculations with DP units, everything highlighted here in orange is a DP type. Uh, and you can see that we're dividing them, multiplying them, subtracting them, and so on. But if we compile this and take a look at the decompiled bytecode, we'll see that actually everything here is just floats and ints. So we're not creating any objects for these calculations, and we're barely calling any functions. Uh, all of this is just primitive types and operations on those primitives. We are calling one function over and over, which is this constructor impulse that's generated for the DP type. But that's a static function which returns the float value that it receives. So that's also going to get optimized away very quickly at runtime. Finally, uh, to wrap things up, I want to talk a bit about coroutines in Compose. And coroutines are widely used in Android uh, for getting off of the main thread and doing background work without blocking the UI and coordinating that background work, making sure that we keep hold of it uh, using structured concurrency. But what we don't really use it for that much, uh, traditionally at least, is doing asynchronous operations on a single thread. And Chris Baines wrote an article about this a couple of years ago, where he took the original view APIs on Android, which use callbacks and listeners heavily, and created suspending wrappers over them, so you could await something like the end of an animation by calling a suspending function. And in Compose, this is actually going to be the core implementation and the core behavior of the framework. So take, for example, this snippet here, which creates the list uh, seen on the right. Uh, the list itself is displayed with the lazy column component, which we're not going to look at in detail. And then other than the list, we're also going to have this scroll to top button uh, in the example, which is that button in the bottom right corner. And once that button is clicked, uh, we're going to launch a new coroutine and call animate scroll to item on the list state, scrolling up to the top of the list with that. Uh, there's also a wrapper called animated visibility here, which will make sure that the button is only shown when we actually do some scrolling, so it's not visible when we're at the top of the list. And as you can see, tapping the button gets us to the top of the list. So why is this exciting for us? Well, because this animate scroll to item call is a suspending function, which means that if we want to do something after the animation has completed, we can just write sequential code on the next line, and it will happen after the animation. For example, let's say that I want to display a message after this. And now I could make a call to the snack bar APIs, which display this kind of message on the bottom of the screen. It would appear after the animation is completed and eventually time out on its own. The snack bar APIs also allow you to um, accept some interaction. You can add an action label to it. So now I'm going to put a button on the snack bar called revert which is going to restore the previous scroll position in case the user has accidentally used the button to scroll to the top of the list. And I need to handle this somehow if the user taps the button instead of letting the snack bar disappear on its own after it's timed out. And you might expect that I could pass in an onclick function uh, to show snack bar or something like that. But this is also a suspending function, um, which will wait for the result of the snack bar which is either that the user has performed the action, which is what we want here, or that it just timed out on its own. So we can really see coroutines being used for a variety of things here. In the first case, we are waiting for an animation being executed by the framework to complete. Then we are waiting for a timeout with a snack bar, and we might also be waiting for user input. And all of these can be just suspending functions. So the way that we would actually implement this is um, we would grab a couple of values from the list state at the start of our coroutine, just saving them into local variables. And then at the end, if the action on the snack bar was performed, we would call animate scroll to item again to scroll back uh, to the um, original position. So now if we run that code, you'll see that we can scroll down, we can tap the button to scroll back up, and we have the revert action now, which restores our previous position. We can actually just keep doing this back and forth. Uh, like that, and if we scroll to the top with the button and we let the snack bar time out, our coroutine will complete that way, and that actually also completes our talk. So I want to point you to some resources that you can take a look at. First of all, if you're writing post code, there's a very, very detailed document with API guidelines um, that tell you how to design APIs and uh, tell you a lot of details about the conventions that Compose is using. Then there's a dedicated page in the Android documentation about how Kotlin is used for uh, Compose, similar to this talk, but shows other examples. And finally, if you want to learn more about just what Compose is and how it works under the hood, there's a great talk here from Android Dev Summit 2019. And the rest are articles that I've already mentioned. So 
thanks for attending this talk that was composing an API with Kotlin.